As you find your seats, if you'll turn with me to the book of Colossians, it's a small letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, uh, toward the back of your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's one there in front of you in the pew. Uh, You could use that. Also, the words will be on the screen. This morning, we are in week two of a sermon series we're going to be in all month. Uh, It is called First Things First, as we start the new year of seeking God's face. This morning, we're going to be looking at making a room for God. So I I spent the last two to three weekends uh, cleaning my garage. Have you been there? I mean, usually your garage accumulates junk. I don't know what it is about a garage, but there's more and more stuff that eventually gets there. And you start, well, a new year, finally I'm going to get to my garage. Finally, I'm going to try to do it. And again, I don't know about you, but I, I could probably knock this out in a day. And you start getting into it like, oh my goodness, there's more junk here than I realized. Well, according to some recent surveys, three out of four, as high as 70% of households, had too much stuff in their garage to even park their cars. Does this look familiar to anybody right here? So that's supposed to be a garage, right? That's supposed to have uh, stuff in it. By the way, that is not my garage but it could be my garage. And so it's interesting to see the number of statistics of how many people don't even use their garage for what it was intended, to park cars. So here's another thing. Removing junk ranked as the top answer from people who were asked how they can enjoy their garage more. Hit pause. Enjoy your garage more? But anyway, all right, the question was asked, removing junk. That 33% of the people, the owners of garages, don't open their doors. Why? They're too embarrassed. They don't want their neighbors to see this junk, right? They want to say, a lot of people actually say, oh, my house is pretty clean, but my garage, it's almost like that area you give up on, you know? Put all the junk right there. Remember, cars are actually built to put cars, uh, garages are uh, built to put cars in them. But again, many of us just with so much junk in our garage, our cars will not even go near them. Well, as I have actually done, what I've done, as many garage owners have, it's so full of treasures in our garage, right? So I have filled uh, the treasures I had in there with garbage can after garbage can. I'm like, I want to leave a note to the people who are collecting trash, because my garbage cans are like puking all over the place. Um, They're heavier than can be, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And I love it when they come get it, because why? I can put more stuff in it. And then yesterday, I loaded my car up with treasures that I took to the sharing center. Uh, And I just want you to know this about your pastor. I got worried because it was a little bit after four, and I texted the CEO, Nina. Hey, are you guys still open? I called her. She texted me back, I'm on a mission trip in Guatemala. (laughs) What's she doing there? I need her. I got to give her my stuff, right? So I find out it's closed, so I do what any respectful pastor would do. I drive around to the back where it says, do not enter. I entered and went back, met with a great young man named Alpha who helped me unload all of my treasures and give it to them. But let me tell you, uh, do you know the uh, the classic hymn, the old rugged cross, you know, on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross? One of of those uh, lyrics says this. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. See, I sing, you guys want Scott more. I love it. But there's a picture I want to show you. This is inside my trash can, and I finally laid down in my trash can my trophies. There they are, uh, my life's worth of trophies got finally thrown away. Some might say 30 to 40 years after they should have been thrown away, but there's some treasures in that. You know, you take them to the trash can. Oh, throw, I literally threw my trash, my, my trophies away. But again, my, car, my garage is built for cars, and I have filled it with trophies that I've collected all my life, which other people would call junk. Well, like our garage, we fill up our lives with junk. Not just junk food, but all kinds of junk. We are created by God. We are created for God. And we have chosen through our sinfulness and depravity to replace God with the junk of this world. 
what we need to do is we need to make more room for God. It's kind of like, think about cleaning out your garage. Uh, so this morning, uh, in the week two of a sermon series entitled, First Things First, we're going to look at making room for God. Uh, last week, we looked at seeking God's face in 2023. Let me encourage you, all these sermons are online. They're available to you. I know that life gets full, and there's some weeks you're not able to make it. But I, I really feel God's Spirit pressed upon me. Start January, King's Chapel, and Jeff seeking God's face. So if you missed it last week, let me encourage you to go back and listen um, to, to get caught up. But this morning, we're going to be looking at making room for God. We're going to look at three things. One is created by God and for God. That's each one of us. Secondly, that we are recreated in Christ for God. And then lastly, making room for God. Our text this morning is going to be out of the book of Colossians, Colossians 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 17 uh, in this incredible text that Paul has given to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So hear with me the word of the Lord. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would come and, and that you would join us as teacher, that God, that you would do that which only you could do. Would you be pleased to speak through a broken sinner like me? God, as we read your word, we realize that, that you would even speak at one time through a donkey. So God, our hope is that you could speak uh, through me, uh, your, your servant and son. Oh God, would you give us ears to hear your voice? God, would you give us minds that would understand your word? Your word says that we are set our minds on you, on the things above. Oh God, help us by the power of your spirit and the preaching of your word to do that. That, God, you would soften our hearts to, to receive and embrace your truth. And, God, what's going to be so important with this is that, that you would empower us to, to walk in a manner worthy of your name. Because you're telling us that, God, we're to make room for you, that because of who we are in Christ, our lives should be markedly different than those who don't know you. That we should walk in a manner worthy of your name that we should walk in, in the good works that you have prepared in advance for us to walk in. 
So God, come and empower us, not just to hear your word, but to be doers of your word. And God, the things that I say that are wrong are merely my opinion. May those things fall away and be forgotten. But the things that are said that are true and contain the good news of the gospel, would you use those things to make us more like your son Jesus, our Savior? And it's in his matchless name that we pray. Amen. Well, just as garages were originally designed and created for cars, uh, you and I are originally designed by our God and created by our God for Him. Just like a garage is supposed to be filled with cars, and kudos to the Moors for your boys say your cars are in there. Um, uh, we were created for God, by God, watch this, for our lives to be filled with Him. Uh, but we, we have driven that out. For the story of the Bible is this. It's so beautiful. From the very first chapter, from the very first pages of Genesis, Genesis 1.27, he tells us this about who we are, that we have been created in the image of God. Male and female, we've been created in God's image. Of all the things that God created, and by the way, he created everything, and by the way, he created everything out of nothing, whew, mighty God. But the capstone, the beauty of his creation was you and me being made in his image to reflect who he is, to know and love him. God is created as then we get to like Psalm 139. And I love this, especially as we look at Choices Women's Clinic that we love to support because Psalm 139 will remind us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God himself is the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. That God was there and saw our unfor unformed body. That all the days of our lives were written down before one came to be. That's our God. He's the creator of life. And he's created us in his image, and he's created us for himself. And he created us for, our, for himself to walk with God, to basically pursue God, to be known by God and to know God, to love God and to be loved by God. That's why he created us. You ever want to know your purpose? It's for him, right? And so that's where we are, to walk with him. I love how the Bible starts that, that Adam, we would walk with God in the cool of the evening. I don't know what that looked like, but man, does that sound awesome uh, to be able to walk through paradise with God. Uh, love that. We are to live in a loving fellowship with God. That was our design. And basically he's saying this. In the beginning was God. He's the first thing. First things first is God. God should be first in our lives. We were created for him. But it was more than that. We were created to be fruitful for God. And he says in the very beginning, be fruitful and multiply. He wants us to, to reign in his place as his people. He wants us to bring his rule, his light here on earth, to be fruitful, uh, to multiply. He wants us to, to bring glory, his glory, to the earth, to fill the entire earth with his glory. Now let me tell you, those are big, lofty things. Let's put it in your terms. Wherever you are, whoever you are, God has made you in his image. And whatever he's given you is a family, a job, a home, a place, he wants you to use that spot for his glory. He wants to be filled up wherever you are. So you don't have to look at my life or someone else's life and say, I want that. No, God's giving you yours. And he's giving you yours on design, on purpose. But it's to live and know and love him and to fill the earth, to be fruitful where you are and to fill the earth with his glory. But we don't get far into the story of God. Just three chapters where we realize something went tragically wrong and it's our sin and rebellion. Although we were made for God and by God, and although we were made to have fellowship with him, it took us three chapters to rebel from him. And basically, we did this. We chose God's stuff and the world's stuff over God. We replaced God with the things of this earth. We replaced God and put ourselves on the throne. Uh, and, and, and we started to fill up our hearts and our lives with junk. Junk that wasn't God. Like a garage, we filled up our lives uh, instead of cars with junk, and sin replaced God. Uh, and we were driven for God's presence. Instead of seeking God as we were originally designed to make, be made, we started seeking ourselves. We started seeking stuff. We lost the first things first. We lost it. As a matter of fact, sin, is, uh, the scripture will say, it was such a bad loss that we can't even find it apart from God's grace. Here's what it's saying. That sin affected us. The soul that sins is going to die. And that, that by nature, we're children of wrath. By nature, we're never going to seek God's first. It says it's in Scripture that, that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. 
that this, something has to happen because we've lost this, this one that we were created for, the one we're to be filled with, the one we're supposed to pursue. We lost it. But God is so gracious, and he restored it. We are recreated in Christ as a Christian, Scripture will say, someone who surrendered their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. This doesn't just mean a church member or a moral person. No, this is, this is different. This is somebody who acknowledges to holy God, hey, I'm a sinner in need of grace. And I see and recognize Jesus and Jesus alone as, as Savior. And I put my faith and trust in him. And then, then if that is who we are, it, Scripture says we're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Scripture says we've been born again. That's amazing. But that's who we are as Christians. We are recreated. God who created us, his son recreates us in Christ for God again. I think I told you a few weeks ago my computer died. It was like right before Advent. I mean, it was like, you know, busy time of year. Uh, I had things pulled up on my computer. Uh, it died after uh, we lost power in the house. I had things I couldn't save. All of a sudden, it's all gone. I mean, I'm panicking, freaking out. Uh, and, and like many of you have had that experience. So I went and got a new computer. And so thankfully, uh, although I hadn't backed my computer up in the last couple of weeks, most of the things I had, I backed up. And so I, I, I took that hard drive, that backup drive, I plugged it into the new computer, and I just spent that time waiting to, for it all to transfer over, and all the stuff to go over. And you know what happened? All the viruses and all the bugs that I had on my hard drive and my old computer, boom, there they were. I was like, seriously, I got a new computer and already the thing's soiled? It's already messed up? So thank God for young people like my son JP who said, Dad, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to re redo this. We're going to have to reset this to the original settings. So we had to take everything and purge everything out and put it to the original settings. And then after we had the original settings was to choose what things do you want to drag over? What things do you want to put in? And what things do you want to keep out? Well, really, that is who we are in Christ Jesus. We, he, he has reset us to the original. Now, this isn't fully correct. We're not reset to the original as Adam's original, because he knew no sin. But we are reset. We, we are recreated in Christ. Again, this is what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, meaning not just church membership, morality, but in Christ, placing your faith and trust as Savior, Scripture says he is, she is a new creation. You're new. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God has made something new of us. Right? We have a new identity. We are to have a new way of thinking. And in this passage... I don't know if you heard it in, in verses 1 through 4, but it links us to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As Christians, this is so important. Our salvation isn't found just because we're faith, in our faith. Our salvation is found in the object of our faith, Jesus. And as Christians, here's what God does. It's such a great exchange. The righteous life that Jesus lived is credited to our account. The, the atoning death that Jesus died on the cross was paid for us. And the resurrection of Christ over sin and death, we have been resurrected in Christ too. If you read through scripture like Romans chapter 6, I'm not going to refer to it, but for those of you good Bereans who want to go back and look, look at Romans 6 verses 3 through 11. Because it will say some things that sound mysterious. We have died with Christ. And as we have died with Christ, we've been raised with Christ. And we will, we will be with him when he comes again. So in God's eyes, he looks at us in Christ Jesus as if Jesus' life were ours, as Jesus' death were ours, and Jesus' resurrection is ours. This is how we are forgiven. This is how we are free. This is how we have been made new. Uh, this is how we have the resetting. He took all of our sins, all of our viruses, all of our brokenness, and he put them on Jesus. And he says, now because you are new, don't put back in some of your viruses. Uh, don't, don't do it. Uh, make sure you, your life should be different. Listen, Christian, we should be so radically different than the people who don't know Jesus that they think we're crazy. We should live our lives in a way that they call us peculiar. 
Who are these people? The way they love one another. What in the world? The way they love their God. The way they are selfless. The way they give to others. This is who we should be. We should have a new identity, a new way of thinking. In Colossians 1, it says we should be thinking, uh, seeking 3.1. We should be seeking the things above. We should be setting our, thi- our mind on the things above. He's basically saying this. If you are in Christ, first things first. And the first thing first is, is God. And if you are a Christian, God has given you the Holy Spirit that empowers us uh, to seek God first. Not only that, now that we've been reset, uh, we are to walk with God. We're to walk in a manner worthy of his name. Ephesians 4.1 says that. Colossians 1.10 says that. 1 Timothy says that. Over and over, you're his, walk in a manner worthy. All right? He also says, again, be fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply. Not just you, pastor, but all of us. I love the way Jesus says this to his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. It's called the Great Commission. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's saying, be fruitful and multiply, all of us. So let me hit pause. We hear this and we think, ah, the ends of the earth and all the people, isn't that like missionary's job? And, And isn't that like pastor's job? No. All of us are to live fruitful lives of multiplication around your living room, in, in, in your workspace. Um, again, you may say, well, Jeff, I'm, I'm not an evangelist. Neither am I. I, 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 I don't know enough, enough scripture. It's okay. But our job is to be fruitful for him. Why? To bring him glory. Putting God first. Doing all things for, for his kingdom, for his glory. So how do we do it? The only way we'll be able to do it is to make room for God. I, I love what it says. It's Okay. Now, set your mind on the things that are above, right? Uh, seek first the things that are above. I mean, you make sure your heart is set on the things that are above. But for you to do it, uh, you've got to make room. And he's going to say, put to death. It's an interesting Greek word. It's actually the word where we get death from. Put to death certain things. There are certain sins that we should treat like black mold or cancer, right? If you go into your garage and you see black mold, growing. You know, ah, no big deal. I, I, I don't need to worry about that. You know, no, eventually that's going to eat up things. It's not going to be good for your health, right? I mean, there's certain things that are cancer. If you get diagnosed with cancer, you know, you're not going to have a doctor say, oh, it's no big deal. Let's let that thing grow. You know, let's just let that grow and see what happens. No, you get it the heck out. You get it out as fast as you can, uh, however you can. You cut it out. You, you radiate it out. Uh, what, whatever you chemo it out, you get it out. And so we got to look at what are the things that God's word says put to death. I mean, put to death. Get them out. We're to kill them. And it says, what is earthly in you? And I want to say, what is not earthly in me? But the first three things that he says that are earthly, that we're to put to death, are all have, have a sexual connotation. We are made in God's image. We are to, our bodies now are, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He cares about our our physical being, especially our our sexual uh, morality. And the first thing he says, put to death sexual immorality. And it's interesting, the Greek word is pornea. Uh, The Greek word pornea has a wider range of what that actually means. Uh, It's really any form of sexual immorality, any perversion outside of God's design for sex and marriage. So what does that include? Well, it certainly includes adultery. Uh, and it certainly includes pornography. Uh, it certainly includes uh, uh, marriage as, in a way that's outside of God's intent. It's, it includes sex before marriage. I mean, it's anything outside of God's design is pornea. And how incredibly captivated is our culture with sexual morality? I mean, how much in our face is this over and over again? And God said, this isn't just not a slight, small deal. Put it to death. Put it to death. Get rid of your computer if you need to. I mean, whatever you got to do. Impurity. Any substance, this means any substance that's filthy or dirty, like refuse, like dung, uh, even even maybe dirty jokes and filthy talk, put it to death. And then the word passion here really means lust, the lust in your heart. 
I love it that Jesus says, don't think you didn't commit adultery just because it wasn't a physical act. Those of you who lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. I mean, it's, it's not supposed to happen. Uh, so put it to death. And again, in the flesh, we're always going to wrestle with it. It's almost like a daily putting it to death. But then he says also evil desires. Uh, desiring anything that's forbidden. Something that's forbidden. Something that God hasn't given to you. And then the one that maybe intrigues me the most to put to death is covetousness, which is really greed. Now watch what he says. Because, which is idolatry. I want to say, wait a minute. Greed is idolatry? How is greed idolatry? Well, really, it's replacing God, right? It's replacing God with stuff. It's seeking things over seeking God. And so he's saying it's idolatry. Anything we pursue outside of God is idolatry, even ourselves. So we, we got to put those to death. Then he says, put away. Um, and there's a list here. And this this the way he means put away. This is to divide, to divest oneself from, to take off. It almost is like a, a garment. Take these things off. It's no longer fitting for you as a Christian. Those of you who have new life in Christ Jesus, this doesn't match anymore. This isn't in fashion anymore. You shouldn't be wearing these things. This is what the world wears. My people shouldn't wear them. And then there's things like anger. And this, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I know Holy Spirit's going to convict you. It's convicting me. Uh, anger. We shouldn't be anger. This is focused on retribution. This is anger. Oh, I'm going to get you. I'm stinking back. You know, I remember a guy cut me off a couple years ago. I was pulling out on 436. I chased him down. I just hit the gas pedal, and I'm going to go find him. And I'm telling you, in the first seven or eight, ten seconds, if I found him, I would have dragged him out of the car, and I would have whooped him. And about, about a mile down the road, I'm thinking, the headline, pastor. <laughs> he was cut off. I was cut off. You know, I mean, the, the nerve of that guy of cutting me off. I'm going after him. I know that there's somebody in our church who'll go nameless, who won't put any Christian things on their car because they drive like this. Put away anger. Put away wrath. It's a state of intense displeasure or rage. You know when you're wrathful? Because you're not getting your will done. You're living for your will be done in your life. And we get angry. and We get filled with rage when life doesn't work the way we want it. Not the way that he wants it to. Do you know that we get more anger and rage at what goes wrong for us than what goes wrong for God? Oh, God. We could, we could be sinful and not really care, but someone cuts us off. We can't get things to fix. We can't get things to align. Angry and wrath. Put it off. Malice. Mean-spirited. Mean-spirited. Put it away. Slander. Speech that denigrates or defames. Saying something about somebody that's not only not true, but it's not honoring your neighbor as yourself. It denigrates. It defames. Obscene talk. Speech that is considered in poor taste. And I think for most of you, that's humor. Not that I'd ever know that. Are you laughing at Mary Lou? It's true, isn't it? Do not lie to one another. Put off the old self. Put on the new self. It's basically saying, listen, if you are in Christ Jesus... Um, put off the old self that's died. Don't feed it. Now put on the new self, which, which is in Christ. Put on. Put on. Now listen, as God's chosen one, God's special people, God is sovereign. Now, sometimes people read things like God's chosen one. Oh my goodness, can God choose us? Aren't we choosing him? Am I going to, is God is going to be, listen, God is sovereign. And the Father loves his creation, but he chooses to love his own in a unique way. And don't you dare put yourself in the one that God's place is. That God is the one. God is the one before, scripture, before time began, Scripture tells us, that decided to love a bunch of knuckleheads that he calls his own. And we are no different than the world who doesn't embrace him other than the grace of God and the work of his Son and the fact that his hand is upon us. But we are, as his chosen people, we're his church. And embrace it. 
I mean, it's an amazingly beautiful thing. We are God's unique chosen bride. I, by God's grace, chose Katie to be my wife. She is it. There's no one like her. She is special. Y'all, I mean, nothing compares to her because she is my chosen by God's grace wife. We are his chosen bride. Wear it. It's beautiful, right? right? Holy and beloved. Holy means not only without sin, it really means set apart. So he wants you to know, I chose you, I love you, I set you apart, and you're beloved. You're mine. Nothing will separate you from my love. Nothing. Not even your sin, not even death, nothing. This is who we are. Because of who we are, now we put on compassionate hearts, which is a display of concern over another's misfortune, pity or mercy. Man, I hope that's us, loving our neighbor. Kindness, a quality of being helpful or beneficial. Goodness, put on humility. I love this self-abasement. Scripture says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look out only, not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Each of us should have the attitude of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality God something to be grasped. We, we are to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But my goodness, how much do we do out of selfish ambition or vain conceit? Meekness. The quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Oh. Man, that's, that, that, that hits home. That we're not the center of the universe. Jesus is. He's the king. We aren't. He's the Lord. We are not. We are not to put ourselves on that throne. We're not to put ourselves above our neighbors, our own self-importance. Why do we get angry? Why, why, why do we get so ticked? Because of our own self-importance. Patience. The state of remaining tranquil while awaiting an outcome. <laughs> Cross that out. That's not supposed to be in there. Um, of course it is. Patience. The state of remaining tranquil while awaiting an outcome. Steadfast endurance. Waiting on the Lord. That's probably the thing I'm learning this year more than that. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Bearing with one another. Tolerance. Putting up with one another. We're knuckleheads. We've got to put up with one another. Some of you it's harder than others. What's the joke? Forgiving one another as the Lord God forgave you. We should be a people loving one another, forgiving one another, and put on love above all else. This is agape, this selfless love. Love for God, love for neighbor. And as we land this plane, there's a few things that Paul says of let us. And you can't miss these, okay? Let us. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Do you have peace in your life? Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Because why? In Christ Jesus, watch this, we have peace with God. We really do. There was a sacrifice made that, that made holy God love and accept us just as we are. We have peace with God. It's amazing. And we're supposed to have peace with one another. And, and now, he says, be thankful. He, divide, he knocked down the dividing wall between us and between God. Be thankful. We have peace in the midst of turmoil. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let this get here and here that impacts this. Let it dwell in you. We should be teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms with all thankfulness in our heart. I love the fact. You know, we're trying to have many of you read through Scripture this year. Uh, we, we, we're trying to do everything we can to equip you to reach those around us. I mean, this is God's word. May it dwell in you richly. It's a benefit of this. When life bottoms out and you have God's word, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, what did he use to fight back? Scripture. Because the word of God even dwelt richly in him. May it dwell richly in us. And then lastly, in whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Make room for God. What I'm realizing, this is not a one-time thing. I can't clean my garage once and be over with it, right? It's almost something you got to daily do, continually make room for God in our lives, continually deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him. How is it with you? Where do you need to make room for God? I mean, honestly, let me ask you this question. What do you have to put to death? What does the Holy Spirit just kind of say, oof, this is it. 
What do you have to put away? It's no longer befitting you. Anger, wrath, self-importance. What do you need to put on of that fruit of the Spirit? First things first, seek God's face. Clean out the garage of your heart and make room for God. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for making us new in Christ Jesus. Thank you for not treating us as our sins deserve. Thank you for amazing grace every step of the way. But God, you have created us in your image for yourself, and you've purchased us with the blood of Christ for yourself. You've recreated us, you've you've reset us to that original settings to live for you. Oh God, would you give us the grace to put to death that which you've called us to put to death? God, may we put off, put away those things you told us to put away. May we put on those things, not so that you will love us, because you already do love us. Not so that we can become yours, but because we are your chosen people holy and beloved, we should walk in newness of life. Oh God, may this church, may this pastor make room for God today and always. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.